Come on. Your hands and sing. places now on to him the same God that led the children of Israel out of dry land into the promised land now on to him the same God that was the fourth person in the fiery furnace the same God that was with Daniel in the lion's den
Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's an absolute, well, good afternoon, I should say. It's an absolute privilege to be with you again and for some of you for the first time. So welcome to the uh, uh, Declaration 2022 Theology Workshop. And today we're looking at the theme of community and climate. It's my privilege to be able to facilitate the session. My name is David Chasanya. I've had the privilege of facilitating uh, the workshops this week. And I must say they've just got increasingly, uh, incrementally um, better and not because the, the content necessarily has been um, uh, poor in one and not so poor and not so good and, and brilliant in the other, but simply because there seems to be a, a momentum building and a real sense of um, interconnectedness between the thoughts of the various uh, contributors. So it's an absolute pleasure to have you here this afternoon as we deal with this fundamentally important issue of uh, community and climate issues that are very uh, central to Christian faith and central to African and Caribbean, as well as other communities, but given the focus of the well, uh, intrinsically a part of um, African and, and, and Caribbean cosmology and part of the ontological experience that each, each uh, community has. So really brilliant. We've got some fantastic speakers. We've got theologians, we've got activists, we've got theologian activists, and we've got people that have um, just got a wide range of experience that's born uh, of thoughts born out of uh, their experience. I want to say at the very outset, as I've said at every session, thank you to Tear Fund. Thank you to Tear Fund for creating this space, these spaces over the last few days, where we can have uh, a deep dive, deep dive conversation about the issues um, that are really affecting our our world. We had on Monday women on Tuesday, on Monday men, Tuesday women. Yesterday we had the theme of worship and today we're having community and climate. Tomorrow we have youth uh, and the work that Tear Fund and others are doing around young people. But there's lots else that's going on. If you're an early bird, you can get up in the morning and you can spend some time with Tear Fund and you'll see some information that will be posted in the chat in a, in a, in a, during the course of this session. You can spend some time uh, praying with Tear Fund in the morning. Uh, you're here right now. If you've got some time in the afternoon, you want to have a short break between three and four, you can uh, log on to Premier Radio where eBay Giant Killer will be doing interviews, hearing testimonies and hearing stories about what God is doing in people's lives uh, around the world and through Declaration 2022. And then in the evening, we have um, the penultimate event, um, but a big focus event where you can send in your prayers as Seth Binnock and the team will be leading prayers on TBN Live between 8, 8, 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. And I've been watching those events. And yesterday we had Rob, Professor Robert Beckford speaking about uh, justice and worship and how they intersect with each other and how that we must be prophetic, uh, both not, not just foretelling, but foretelling, challenging structures and systems and ushering in the kingdom of God. So that happens tonight at eight o'clock. And then, if you know if you're Instagram savvy, log on to Instagram at we are tier fund and you can be a part of the after party that takes place on Instagram. So there's lots going on over the week and there's lots that has already been going on. I just want to say a very big thank you to tier fund, very big thank you to Seth Pinnock and his team and to Nigel and Ruth and to uh, the team, the senior executive team at Tear Fund, who have just made this uh, a possibility for us uh, this week. So thank you. And we're going to pray. Father, we ask now in the name of Jesus, you pierce our ears, uh, and we pray that you'll anoint our eyes, and we pray that you'll soften our hearts. We pray that as our ears are pierced, and as our eyes are anointed, and as our hearts are made to feel what's on your heart, that, Lord, you would be glorified and will be conformed into your image and we will do justice. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So our theme today, as we said, is community and climate. And just put your name in the, your, where you're from in the, in, the chat, in the chat box, please. And later on, after the first speaker, we'll give you a big old shout out. We're getting people from all over the world 
just to come and, and, and to welcome you. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to introduce our first speaker today. He's very well known to me, Reverend Dr. Israel Oluwa Olofinjana. He's the director of the One People Commission, and he's served a number of uh, Baptist churches in London and has been instrumental in thinking through what has become coined as reverse mission. I'm not going to read all of his bio because it's in the chat box. I want to give him the maximum amount of time uh, to read, but he has a strong pedigree and a long uh, history and is very credible in the uh, field of reverse mission and, and increasingly becoming a voice on um, climate change and the African and Caribbean community. He's married to Lucy and they have two children and it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be welcoming the Reverend Dr. Israel Olofinjana. Bless you, sir, as you share with us for 15 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend David Shosaya, uh, for today and for the welcoming and the introduction. Uh, it's such a privilege to be part of this conversation, to be part of this event declaration and just looking at our theology on various aspects of church life. Uh, and I think the subject we are looking this morning is one that is increasingly getting close to my heart, looking at the climate uh, issues, climate justice issues. And as we're looking at climate, but not just in isolation, but looking at it within community. And what I want to do with my 15 minutes is just to reflect on some themes that I've been wrestling with for the last two years in that sense uh, around three key points. One is around African identity, another is around racial justice, uh, and then the third one, of course, is climate justice. But how this sort of intersect together, uh, I want to look at it in a sort of a three framework. One is fragmentation of identities. Second is looking at transgenerational trauma. And then the last is looking at healing. What does healing look like for us today? In terms of that, you might be wondering why these three thoughts around fragmentation of identity, uh, transgenerational trauma, and healing, it all will become very, very clear. Now, everyone knows that we are currently facing a climate crisis, and we are all looking for ways uh, to develop sustainable thinking of how we can tackle uh, the climate uh, crisis that we are all facing. But I think there is no way we can confront a sustainable future without firstly reflecting on some issues in the past. I think it's very crucial that if we're gonna build bridges into our future and develop a sustainable thinking together, then it seems to me that there are some issues in the past that we really need to address. Uh, and I think that is very crucial for, for me in this talk. So to come to my first point around fragmentation of identities, I, I think today we talk a lot about, especially within the black community, uh, I'm focusing on the community aspect of this talk on the black community, just to be clear from the start. And oftentimes when we talk about the black community today, you know, yes, when we use the word black, of course, it's a generic term, but just sort of breaking it down in that sense, uh, that the reason why we can even begin to talk about black community in today's sense in terms of African-Americans, African-Caribbeans and continental African, and sometimes we even add black British, depending on where you're coming from, is because there's been a, something that ruptured in the past. There was a dislocation of African identity. African identity before enslavement and colonization, uh, whilst not homogeneous, was diverse in the sense of different tribes, different customs, uh, different geographic location, uh, and, and different kingdoms. You know, we had several kingdoms or empires, some we use the term empire, but more appropriately kingdoms, uh, dotted all across Africa. For example, we have Oyo Kingdom uh, in sort of West Africa. We have Bini Kingdom, we have Kanel Bonum, we have Shungai Empire, we have uh, Zulu, we have Congo, and, and, and the list goes on as it is uh, in terms of the homogeneous African identity rooted on the continent. But the enslavement of Africans that happened uh, fragmented African identity so that today we talk about continental Africans, that is those of us who remain on the continent and were not enslaved. 
And we talk about those in the Americas as African-Americans, and we talk about those in Caribbean as African-Caribbeans. And those of us who are now in Britain, we refer to ourselves sometimes as Black British, uh, uh, born in the UK. But we can only speak about those categories today because of the fragmentation of African identity. I mean, just think, there was once a time where African descendants were just seen as Africans. There was no African Americans. There was no African Caribbeans. There was no continental Africans. It was just Africans in that sense. But the enslavement fragmented that underpinned by a kind of a racial ideology uh, that sees human beings uh, as object, as properties uh, in, in, in that sense, the racial ideology that underpinned that see people as properties. Secondly, he saw that people were not intelligent enough and they needed to be ruled. And then lastly, was that they need saving because they were savages, they were hidden as it is. But what sometimes people don't connect is that slavery and industrial revolution is so interlinked. And we talk about industrial revolution that began to that started from around 1750 onwards. What people might not realize is that at the back of industrial change was the slave labor. And so here is a connection between slavery and the climate crisis because industrial revolution accelerated our pollution till today, scientists would tell us that uh, in, in that sense. And so when we talk about industrial change prospering at the back of slave labor, one of the key things that happened during that period of industrial change and age was that cotton replaced wool and guess where cotton was from? It was from the slave plantation in that sense. And so we have converging and an intersectionality or inextricably, inextricably linked ideas of the fragmentation of African identity linked to racial injustice, but at the same time, connecting that with climate injustice all intersecting together. Hence, I talked about fragmentation of African identities. But what was fascinating is that colonization came later to replace enslavement because enslavement was seen as illegitimate trade. We've been dealing with Africans in an illegitimate way. So let's replace it with what was called colonialism. And that was regarded as legitimate trade. And colonization, again, continued that fragmentation of African identities. So that today, uh, you know, so that back then, seven European powers carved and partitioned Africa. Uh, on several lines so that today we have Francophone African countries, we have Anglophone, we have Lusophone, uh, different African countries speaking different languages uh, because of the colonization uh, that continued. And again, colonization is linked to industrial revolution uh, in, in so several instances, because again, it was happening around the same time. So what I'm simply saying is that when we talk about racial justice and climate justice, they are actually not two opposed subject. They are so connected historically. And more pertinent is that they are connected to the fragmentation of African identities, the dislocation of Africans in that sense, which I think there is a need for us to revisit that conversation. Uh, and I think the reason why I'm starting with this is because today when we talk about the climate crisis, the Western approach to the climate conversation is dominated by the green agenda. And the green agenda situates the conversation in nature. It situates the conversation in preservation of wilderness areas, preservation of uh, uh, species uh, that are at a verge of extinction, which I totally understand. And I'm not against preservation of green spaces and desert areas and conservation of wildlife species that are about to extinct. As much as important as that is, a crucial aspect of the climate conversation that I think we need to have today should be rooted in people of color, particularly descendants of Africans, and how the whole connection of the fragmentation of their identities is also linked to the climate crisis. I think it's very important for us to revisit that. And so hence, I talk uh, about a brown agenda or a brown theology, which situate at the heart of the climate discourse at the black community of people of color and the injustices that has been perpetrated in the past. And now we need to revisit those conversations. And so the brown agenda simply put is talking about how we look at the ecological impact and exploitative economies on people of color. 
how has it affected us historically and how does that continue to affect us till today? The, the legacies from enslavement, the legacies from colonialism, how they continue to impact us and also impact the climate crisis is very important. But moving on to my second point, which is around transgenerational trauma. Uh, and again, this is continuing the theme of that rupture from the past, that dislocation of African identity from the past is very traumatic so that transgenerational trauma is, is a term that is often used in psychology uh, to sort of explain the sort of shared, uh, shared pain of a particular people group or of a collective, a collective experience shared by uh, a particular ethnicity. And I think the best way to describe it is that pains from the past surfacing in the present. If I may use a Pentecostal language, Pentecostals will use ancestral curse. That is how some ancestral taboos and causes in the past continue to affect present generation uh, in that particular sense. And I think if there was anything that the death of George Floyd did for us uh, in the year 2000, it kind of opened up that trauma again. And I've been reflecting on that trauma that has been exposed again. It was there before, it was seething underneath, but the death of George Floyd has ruptured it, has brought it back to the surface. Which seems to me that somehow we need to deal with that past. If we're gonna talk about a sustainable future together, if we're gonna talk about tackling injustices together in the future, including climate crisis, and climate injustice, it seems to me that we have to deal with that pain, uh, with, with that dislocation in the past in that sense. It's very, very important for us to deal with it. Uh, and it seems, it seems to me that each time we're trying to move away from this conversation, somehow God in his infinite wisdom reminds us, either it is through some football experience that will come up, and then we have to have the national conversation again. It seems to me that whilst we always point the attention that America uh, is very different from the European context, which I totally agree with, by the way, yes, we are different. And George Floyd died in America. Yes, I totally agree with that. He didn't die on this side of the continent. But often the difference is this, Americans are having this conversation. They are having it, even though they are not perfect, but they are having it. But within the European context, particularly within the British context, we are so reluctant to have this conversation. And it seems to me that as much as we want to move away, whether with football or something, we need to touch on this again uh, in that sense. So transgenerational trauma uh, lingers on from the past. And then to end with healing, because I believe in hope, and I believe that God can bring healing to this crisis. And I think I want to suggest three things that we need to do. One is around truth. Second is around justice. And the third is around reconciliation. So to take sort of uh, some concepts from the truth and reconciliation from Southern Africa, uh, just sort of uh, giving tribute to the work of someone like Archbishop Desmond Tutu who passed away recently. They will talk about in the context of Southern Africa, truth and reconciliation. I'm adding justice in the mix because I think it's important in that sense. And so healing must look like in the form of truth speaking. We need to speak the truth about this. We, we need to assess it. We need to have conversation, conversations around racial justice that will speak truth and that will be confronted with it, as particularly within the European British space. It's important for us to do that. There is something about British politeness that doesn't want to do that. Second is around justice, restorative justice. Of course, that is a legal term used, but can be applied in a New Testament thinking to the work that Christ did on the cross, restoring humanity and reconciling us together, which leads to that third point, reconciliation. But a big part of that reconciliation, we cannot ignore reparative justice. And in climate language, that is described as climate loss and damage uh, in the sense of the fact that our poorer countries who are suffering uh, from the effects of the climate crisis, how the richer countries from the West can help them. That is climate finance, which I think we need to go deeper to climate loss and damage, which will be about actually how we visit the past to begin to address some of the issues that I mentioned how we begin to deal with that, uh, it's very crucial if we're gonna move together to a sustainable future. So I'm just gonna leave it there so that we can have more conversations around that. Thank you very much for listening.
Well, thank you very much for that, um, Reverend Dr. Israel. Some very um, powerful uh, thoughts uh, there about the issue of of justice. I, I just want to, uh, particularly climate justice. I, I really appreciated the way that you uh, drew a connection between the historic legacies of the transatlantic slave trade and the current initiatives to try and address uh, climate justice. One of the things you talked about was a brown theology. And um, love to hear just a bit more about that, if you can just, um, not that it wasn't clear, it was brilliant. Just wanted to hear a bit more, because I think, um, because what I heard is that in Western theology, you said the focus is often on, um, it's, it's often on the, on, on the kind of uh, natural resources and uh, ecological agenda, whereas the African um, agenda when it comes, or the brown agenda when it comes to uh, just uh, climate justice is not just about ecology, but it's about anthropology, it's about human beings as well. And that this is where the reparation and the, the, the kind of restorative justice uh, comes in. So I'd love to just hear you say a little bit more about that. It was fascinating, thank you. Thank you very much, Rev. Yes, I think the, 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 the green agenda is one that oftentimes when we talk about climate crisis and the various approaches to it, we, we talk about the green agenda, which focuses on basically plants and animals and how, you know, just thinking about nature and how we can preserve it. And often the way I describe it is this, if you live <laughs> in a rural area where you're surrounded by green spaces, that definitely will be, will be at the heart of your conversation when it comes to climate crisis. But if you have lived in Southeast London and you see how deprivation is connected to air pollution and you see how deprivation is connected to the kind of jobs people do and how people live and the kind of way we breathe and the cycle, how it's difficult for people to move out of a polluted air to other spaces, then the brown agenda becomes something you are very passionate about because you're situating humanity and racial injustice at the heart of climate crisis uh, in, in that sense. Uh, and I think for me, the, the, the brown field, you know, the brown agenda, that, that is what it's about. It, it's about looking at uh, the human injustices, it's looking at racial justice, uh, injustice in this sense, and how it is connected to the climate uh, issues in that sense. Uh, and again, part of how we look at that would be to look at how, you know, people are losing their homes in uh, other parts of Africa. And sometimes that leads to that migration into Europe. So when we actually talk about, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of discussion around the nationality and border bill uh, in parliament in terms of how to cope migrants coming in, <laughs> you know, in that sense. But actually I think North, um, North Africa is now the current middle passage to use the slavery language again. Mm -hmm. And I think again, if we're gonna be talking about tackling climate issue, we have to look at migration uh, because people are migrating for various reasons, but part of it is also because of the climate crisis. And so when you begin to look at it from that angle, you, you are bringing a perspective uh, from, the, you know, from people of color, not just only black folks, but also Asians in this respect and Latin Americans who are experiencing the crisis in a different way, but situating them at the heart of the discourse and just saying, actually, there is an injustice in the past that connects to the present that we cannot ignore. Uh, and it's very, very important to do that uh, in, in that sense. And again, it's about the green agenda we look at, we point to other countries, you know, uh, developing countries, and we talk about overpopulation as the problem. And those from who are articulating the brown agenda will speak and say actually it's overconsumption of Earth's resources that is causing the trouble in the first place. So we see this sort of two dialogue going alongside. But if I may offer even a further thought, there is an olive agenda, <laughs> which could actually combine both, could combine the green agenda and the brown agenda so that in such a way that it becomes quite powerful so that we are not neglecting caring for creation for plants and animals because they are part of the ecosystem and biodiversity that God created. But at the same time, we cannot remove the injustices, the racial injustice that is connected to this crisis and to this story uh, at the same time. So we, we could look at the olive agenda as a holistic term, as an integral way of dealing with this issue. How, how far 
is that olive agenda entrenched in the dialogue around uh, climate change at the moment from your point of view? Because as I was thinking about this seven hours at this workshop, I was thinking that in one sense, because of the African cosmology and the whole idea of Ubuntu being interconnected to other people, but also to the physical universe. So, you know, uh, John and Beatty talks about how in Africa, if you're going to cut down a tree, you offer something to the gods as a way of, and I'm not suggesting that that's the way we go, but there's this, there is a, there is a, a, a an advanced um, philosophic philosophy of life that says everything is interconnected and inextricably linked. And so it strikes me that um, African and Caribbean Christians in the UK that come from that legacy of the African philosophy that don't have a kind of um, uh, an ecological agenda is, is almost a kind of lived contradiction because that's it's, it's intrinsic to who we are. But you talked about the middle passage and migration has separated us from that in a sense. And so you've got this issue of survival so African and Caribbean people, because of the race issue you talked about, the legacy, are so preoccupied with survival that sometimes what you might consider to be this ethical issue of climate change doesn't actually feature as prominently as it really should. And so we, we almost become a, um, a living contradiction. But how do you feel we can begin to really begin to entrench that, that dialogue within African and Caribbean spaces and to facilitate that conversation between the green and the brown, um, the green and the brown uh, kind of philosophies around climate change. Thank you very much, Rev. I think that's very, uh, uh, very helpful. And actually, I think it'd be helpful to share a little bit of my own story and journey into Please. the climate conversation, because I think it might help to share some light on this. I think I, I grew up in Nigeria, uh, as you are aware of, and the part of Nigeria I grew up on, we experienced constant flooding. And I remember growing up, I thought it was normal because we'd be walking home from school, secondary school, and we'd be playing in the puddles, you know, rain falling, but we'd be seeing businesses torn apart. Uh, we'd be seeing uh, homes devastated, roofs being blown open. I just thought it was a normal thing uh, in that sense, as I grew up in that kind of space and environment. I think it was not until later when I became a Christian and particularly when uh, I went to university to do religious studies and I began to put the dots together to begin to think that actually the flooding we were experiencing was because of climate crisis. And that was when I began to delve deeper and see that actually there were a lot of African theologians that were already speaking and writing about this as far back as the 1970s. Uh, you know, sharing their theological insight on uh, climate issues and their theological insight and perspective. But what was interesting, as you said earlier, was that, you know, when I became a Christian, I was attending a Pentecostal church. Uh, what really preoccupied our mind was not flooding. What preoccupied our mind was survival. So prosperity was the, you know, was one of the things we really embraced, how we survived spiritually, but also materially. And so my Pentecostal church didn't really talk about it or equip me for that sense. It was going to study African theology that actually helped to open up those thoughts and thinking. And reflecting back now, there were also some things that myself and my family, we used to do that we didn't actually know that we were being drained. So for example, we grew some of our own food even without realizing, I'm talking as far back as the 80s, we were growing our own tomatoes. My mom had a poultry. In fact, my first job was working in my mom's poultry where we collect eggs and several things that we were doing. And also there were some practices that were very practical that thinking of on them again is recycling uh, in the sense of, so for example, uh, for, for example, if I may just talk about, uh, you know, where I grew up in Nigeria, we didn't have a washing machine. And what we used to do was hand wash. <laughs> and again, that is being green, but without even realizing it. But what is even more pertinent is that whatever water you use to hand wash, you use it at the same time to flush your toilet. That is pure recycling without do doing too much. But reflecting on these things, I I'm just realizing that actually there were a lot of things we were doing back then in my family and reflecting on my own journey that you could refer as being green. And, and being brown at the same time, but somehow the survival instinct of I want to prosper, or actually there are some exigential realities or things that I need to attend to first before thinking about climate 
uh, that comes in the way and sort of affects us. There is a lot in African spirituality and theology that can help us to begin to open up this area of uh, olive agenda in that sense. Thank you very much, Rev. Um, very I, I, one of the most powerful takeaways I'm, I'm taking uh, from your, I've never seen anybody co co correlate the transatlantic slave trade to climate in the way you have, and that's very powerful. And the, the respective focuses of the West being more about ecology and at the same time undermining um, uh, or exploiting African humanity and, and you know, confusing African identity, but at the same time offering a critique of a lack of action around climate change. So it's almost as if there's an intrinsic contradiction with the, with the green agenda. Uh, that the brown agenda is correcting. And I think that's very powerful. So thank you for that. Um, a question that's coming, I'm gonna pose to you if you don't mind. It says, yeah. how do we stay engaged with climate activism without getting burned out by these very heavy issues and the constant news reports? How do we stay engaged with climate activism without getting burned out by these heavy issues and the constant news reports? I think, yes, I think that's one of the, dangers that I think we stand, particularly as people of faith. And I think while I understand where the media and the public is coming from in terms of alarming us to the fact that we need to respond and we need to do it very quick, I think a Christian response, I've been thinking, is there a way we can begin to look at the climate issues and looking at it from a perspective of hope? And that would mean we need to develop what I'm referring to, a kind of an echo theology that is eschatological in nature because Christianity is about hope and hope is expressed in a person. Hope is not an abstract con concept for a Christian. Our hope is in Christ, the hope of glory uh, in that sense. How, so how can we uh, look forward to the second coming of Jesus, which Pentecostals and other Christians are very keen about, but at the same time still be active in preserving the earth and not just uh, thinking, oh, we're gonna go to heaven and then we're earthly useless as it is. How can we balance our eschatology around an echo theology? I think that's one that we need to do very well. Eschatology should be about hope. And I think that's something we can offer the world, especially around creation theology and recreation or renewal of the earth. How can we do that so that we can bring hope into this? Because I think if, there is, if, if all the conversation is anchored around pessimism, there is a way it discourages people from engaging. There is a way people think, well, if there is no hope, why bother then? But I think there is a way we can anchor our conversation in hope. That doesn't mean we doubt the realities or the fact that we need to act and uh, you know, an urgency to our activism, but the fact that we need to present a different language. And, and that is where I think Christianity offers us language and imagery, a vision of the future that we see in scripture. Uh, that can really help us. So a kind of an, as I said, eschatology that echoes on echo theology that can really help us on that point will be very helpful so that we can combat the pessimism that we see from the public around the subject. Thank you, Rev. Uh, you, you, as you're talking, you're reminding me of um, a book, um, The Theme of the Pentateuch by David Kleins, and he talks about the dissolution of unities and the ecological crisis that ensues after the fall in Genesis. So, but there's hope there, as you're saying, that hope that the serpent's head will be crushed, but the, the, uh, the servant's heel would be bruised. This whole idea of eschatology that you're raising. So thank you uh, for that point, because it, it reminds us again that we have a different starting point as Christians and that we should have a different ending point. So thank you very much for sharing that. Please, Rev, thank you. Hang in there for us, please. We're going to bring in some other speakers to share a bit about what Tear Fund is doing. And then we're going to bring in two further speakers and we're going to have some uh, panel discussions. And please put your questions coming in. We're going to allow you to speak, uh, to ask questions of the speakers as, as they come in. So right now, we're now going to hear from our second speaker, uh, who is uh, Brother Hannington. And Brother Hannington is uh, joining us today uh, to speak about his experience of climate change and climate justice in Uganda. Um, he has a genuine lived and working experience with people in Africa and Asia over 24 cumulative years of working. Hannington has employed different strategic and, and community uh, communications and advocacy techniques to build influential power for young people, for women, for refugees, to research participants uh, in, and people in poverty. So this is a man who has 
a lived experience and is doing work on the ground. He works with Tear Fund's global advocacy team where they challenge social practices and policies and entrench climate change, poverty and extreme and challenge climate change, poverty and extreme inequalities. His role supports the church in China and South and Eastern Africa to build grassroots social movements. He lives in London, UK with his wife and two teenage children. Brother Hannington, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Please share with us for the next few moments. Thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here. It was really good to listen to the Reverend speak um, and give the broad issues that uh, uh, the church could be able to respond to, as um, you have kindly uh, described my work. I work very closely with the church at Tier Fund, where we work. We have a corporate priority called Environment and Economic Sustainability. And we in the advocacy team have this approach uh, where we believe that uh, for system level change to happen, we need to mobilize many people, many people and everybody, ordinary people at wherever they are can be a part of the solution of this climate crisis. But beyond that, we do recognize that when Jesus was on earth, he made statements like, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Seems to me like Jesus' idea of the big challenges that we face today are to be not solved by governments per se, but by the church. And thankfully, the church is everywhere. And so our approach at Tier Fund is work with the church, mobilize the church, support the church to be able to resolve and to address the challenges that the people face. And as you can imagine, the countries where I work in East and Southern Africa, in uh, Nigeria, in uh, China, the real the impact of the climate is real to them. It's not an issue of what we need to do before the degrees come down. It's already on to them. And so they are faced with a challenge. The church, when I say they, I am talking about the church because as I say, the church is the instrument that God is wanting to use and we believe God will use. And the church, therefore, in these places is faced with a challenge of, first of all, addressing the effects when your rains do not come and yet they don't come on time and yet you are purely dependent on the yields of the soil. When the, so, the few resources you put together to build roads, they are washed away in one big flood and the cost of putting up those roads means borrowing and where you are borrowing the 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 the, the conditions are so extreme they leave you in a completely vulnerable situation so it moves from just climate it goes to economics and 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 the economics comes down to when when the economics are bad and when the economics are not working because you're not producing or you're producing but you're not able to transport your goods to the markets uh, then the environment crisis becomes a real present urgent issue for our people and that is what the church is contending with so on one hand it has to contend with a effects on the other the church has to deal with the upstream issues the trees are being cut because people are needing to cook and the the, the the trees are being cut because people are trying to put up dams and electricity dams and and the seas are being scavenged for fossil fuels because that's how we have seen the others develop in the developed economies and so on one hand, we have to deal with those upstream issues. How do we make sure we're planting the right, the, the right numbers of trees to address the carbon, the carbon challenges? How do we make sure that we are not, we're not, we, 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 we are empowering the economies to work 
without using the way others, without going the path, the first, the ones who developed ahead of us used like that of exploiting fossil fuels. This is what the church is faced with. And, and in, a situ, in a place like this, I feel like we guys who are in the church here in London or in other parts of developed countries, we do have real challenges that we also have to face, especially as people of color. Uh, but beyond that, the church in, in the West has challenges that they are having to address, which you articulated very well there, uh, Reverend, and, and I think David has been alluding to them as well. But I'm just inviting the church to think even broader than the West, broader than where we sit. Our challenge is to see, I, I feel that the church in the West, the church in the UK, the church in, in, in America, the church in Australia, the church all over the world needs to look beyond their next door neighbor and begin to think about the neighbors across the seas. These people are suffering immensely. And while we sort our issues, we need to figure out how can we be a part of the solution to help them. I think the church needs to be speaking out more. The theology of the church needs to begin to address real system issues, global issues like debt, like, like the debt that poor countries have. These debts are causing poor countries to have high taxes. With a high tax, it doesn't matter. You go to the bank, I'll talk about Uganda where I come from, and the lending rates, the minimum you can get is 19% interest. Now, which business are you going to do to bring that money out? So people are working with an economy that's not working for them. And you know why? It is because they're in debt. And why are they in debt? Because the people who are trying to help us are not helping us in terms of solving the debt crisis, the needs that we have. So the church, I think, needs to educate itself about the economics that are really affecting people down on the grassroots. Uh, and then the other thing we're looking at, we're looking to see done is to see that what we build, we can support sustainability. I think in the past, a lot of support that has gone on has been piecemeal in small amounts and, uh, and, and not targeting large enough groups. I think the church needs to unite and think about big things that we can do together because together we can achieve a great deal. So I think the church in the West, working with the church in Africa and in Asia and in other parts of the world where real, the crisis is real, it, we need to be thinking about what are the big sustainable investments that we can get into. Thirdly, creating platforms for voices, for voices of real people who are on the ground to be heard, to be heard in spaces where they normally are not. When discussions are happening in the G7 or G20, these voices of real people who are suffering from the crisis are hardly heard. And, and, and I think the church needs to be at the forefront of pushing spaces, creating those spaces for these people to be heard. What we are doing, if I'm concluding on my few remarks, what we're doing at Tia Fund is uh, we're working with uh, different countries and we are mobilizing people, people who are doing something around the environment. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You might be picking plastic, you might be planting trees, you might be do, trying to practice sustainable agriculture. What we're trying to do with these people is try and bring them together into large groups into consortia, if you want to put that way, but we really call them movements. That what you're doing somewhere down in your village and what I'm doing in my other village, when we aggregate them, we have a combined force, a combined force in terms of uh, how we can support each other. You have what I need. And so we are 
really exercising what Christ is teaching us through this theology reverence we've been talking about, bringing people to work together, bringing people to invest together, bringing people to speak together. And these are mostly young people we are initially working with because in movement building, we realize how agile and how quick and how time, time bound things are. And young people, which is really the majority of the countries where we operate, uh, are, are much more uh, a, a better target to go for. And so they have, we have seen, we have seen work happening. We've seen people coming together. We have seen young people speaking to power. We've seen them even at, 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 at a Glasgow recently speaking, but also we have seen young people creating opportunities for each other, working together in Uganda. They're, they're, they're collecting plastics and, and growing and growing that in, Zam in Zambia in the copper belt. Young people are looking for creative ways of making income in a way that is green and sustainable. This is where I see the church being of tremendous support to people like that. Brother Hannington, thank you very much for that. Lots of, uh, lots of content for us to think about and there's lots of questions uh, that are coming in. I'm gonna, um, uh, in a moment, going to just uh, uh, bring some of those questions to the fore. There's, there's church leaders here, there's church workers here. You've articulated a very big vision and a, and a comprehensive vision, a vision about building movements, a, build, a, a vision about engaging young people with agility. Um, this ties into what Professor Beckford was saying about having a, a prophetic role that is both about forth telling the future, the hope that Reverend Dr. Israel talked about, but also challenging power for, for you know, um, foretelling and foretelling. Any, any leader that's online at the moment, what's the first step you would tell them to take to move towards becoming an integral part of a movement that can begin in the UK, in Nigeria, in Africa, in, uh, in America? What's the first step that they could take uh, from that vision you've articulated? Oh, that's a powerful question. And thank you. I think the first step is education, educating ourselves um, to understand what else are people out there having to contend with. Because as you see the spectrum of issues, as, uh, as a church here, each church is able to see what is their their advantage, their competitive, their, 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 their strength, what part of the problem can they address? It might be that your church has influential people. It might be that your church has some resources. It might be that your church has some young people who can go out and combine with other young people. Depending on the strength of your church, understanding the real problem, allowing yourself to understand the problem might help to see what you can do. Thank you for that, Brother Hannington. Very practical. Um, is, there, is, is there ways in which people can connect with you, connect with Tear Fund to begin to get more awareness of access to engagement with these networks that are beginning to form around uh, the different parts of the world? Yes, absolutely. Tear Fund um, has... Um, has we, 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 or if you come to the Tier Fund website, you'll find us. Uh, the, the global uh, advocacy team is purely focusing on this, but we work very closely with the EES team. Uh, EES is Environment and Economic Sustainability. Again, if you go on our website, you can find a lot of information on how you can be a part of what we are doing. But we're really, really excited to see the church in the UK looking at this as a, as a climate crisis. And we have loads of resources, what you can say to your church, how you can engage young people, how you can engage women, how you can engage people in business, how you can engage farmers. All this is available. And I think this is where Tier Fund has that opportunity that you can tap into. Brother Hannington, I want to say really thank you very much. Your presentation, like Reverend Doctor, is very clear, gives us some very practical things to do and points us to the resources and the potential relationships that are available through Tear Fund. So I want to encourage people to touch base with the Tear Fund uh, site so that they can see um, what is available and how you can get involved. Before we have a short video in a few moments, I just want to welcome 
all our guests from all over the place, from Cambridgeshire, from Devon, from Milton Keynes, from Bedford, Bradford, Luton, um, uh, people from Manchester, London, Nigeria, and America. I'll look through to see if anyone from anywhere else has joined us, but we just wanna to say to you, welcome. And uh, in a few moments after the video, we're going to have an opportunity to ask some, to, some questions. I'm gonna introduce our two panelists coming in later. And what, what I do when I introduce you, I'm just gonna ask you to share some reflections on what you've heard already before we turn directly to the questions. We'll take the video right now. Thank you very much, Kate. The pandemic isn't over. Millions of people living in poverty are still trying to recover from the devastation of COVID-19. People have lost loved ones, their homes, their jobs. Thousands can never go back to the lives they once had. Our mission is to follow Jesus where the need is greatest, responding to crises and partnering with local churches to bring restoration to those living in poverty. In partnership with Tear Fund, the well seeks to encourage and empower those suffering the effects of the pandemic to discover for themselves the tools and the resources they need to recover together. Please act now. We cannot afford to wait. Text RECOVER to 70122 to give £17 or visit tearfund.org forward slash recover. Your gift could provide a family with health training and food support for three months. Give today and let's recover together from COVID-19. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Tear Fund, for all that you're doing. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be a partner. I've already uh, given £17. Pounds. I'm not saying that to boast. I'm saying that to say that it's a good initiative. If you're a taxpayer, the government would add in an, an extra four pounds. You, the tier fund would end up getting twenty-one pounds at no cost to yourself, and they can use that money to make a big difference um, with people across the world. So please, if you got um, if you got your phone with you, just um, you can do it via text. Uh, the number is in the chat box seven zero one double two, or you can log on to the world website and you can um, make a contribution there of 17 pounds. So thank you so much to Reverend Dr. Israel Olafinjana and to Brother Hannington for your clear and challenging contributions that you've made so far. We're now going to welcome an additional panelist who's going to make a contribution. And uh, our first panelist is Jeremy Williams. And Jeremy grew up in a missionary family in Madagascar and now works as a writer and a campaigner on social and environmental issues. He is the author of a book called Climate Change is Racist. So you probably uh, have a good dialogue with um, Reverend Dr. Israel around some of the intersections about historical transatlantic legacies there. So the book is called Climate Change is Racist. If you've got uh, Amazon access to it, go ahead and buy that book and, and have a read. Um, Climate Change is Racist and, it, and it, it's subtitled Race, Privilege and the Struggle for Climate Justice and um, he's the editor of Time to Act, a handbook for Christian climate activists. He lives in Luton with his wife and two children, and together they help lead an outdoor church planted out of Stopsley Baptist Church. Thank you for all that you do and all that you've done. Uh, please take a few moments just to share with us uh, some of the responses that you've had as you've listened, and then we'll just uh, uh, take some further questions. Thank you. Yeah, it was a, a really fascinating set of presentations and um, what Reverend Israel was saying about the legacy of colonialism and slavery and how that feeds into industrialization and therefore into climate change is a big theme in the book. And, and I 100% agree, you can trace it right through the history. Uh, an ethic of white power taking what it wants first from people and then from the land. And now we see exactly the same ethic from taking from the atmosphere, feeling entitled to take what is not ours to take. And, and it's one story that runs all the way through. And um, it's a, a powerful presentation. And uh, I was really interested in where you came to at the end 
um, the Reverend, when you were talking about healing. And what it made me think of <laughs> was the story in Revelation where we see the tree of life standing in the New Jerusalem and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And I was thinking of the fragmentation of African identity that you were talking about. And for me, that was a real picture of the healing of the nations and that vision in Revelation of how that could be. And of course, what we see in that picture in Revelation is we see the city and in the city, there's the river and there's a tree. <laughs> and we have this beautiful picture of God's creation and also of human creation in the city. And the two are in harmony. And uh, there in that harmony, we would find the healing of the nations. So that was just something that I wanted to, to bring as a reflection on that. Thank you very much for that, Jeremy. I'm going to uh, pose a question to you that's come in. And uh, I'll introduce um, uh, Reverend Dr. Israel and also Brother Hannington to some questions as well. This question comes in from Reverend Tadeak Basanwa, and he asks, in, in, in the light of all we've heard, and including what you've just said, how can we balance these ecological needs with the dire need for economic development in the majority world? What kind of conversation should we be having? And what do you think about campaigns against oil palm oil palm plantations, a business which provides uh, mil for millions of livelihoods. Um, what, what's, what's your thoughts? Mm, thank you. Yes, it's a really good question. And um, Huntington spoke a little bit about this, that one of the most important things is that what the way that the West has developed has set a pattern for a, a form of development which is harmful to the earth. You know, we, you look at the invitation that's there in uh, Genesis chapter one from God to um, be fruitful and multiply and let there be life. <laughs> and what we have in the West is we have consumer capitalism where we say, let there be destruction for profit. <laughs> that's the invitation that we've brought to the world is destruction for profit. And you think for countries that are still developing where people are still being lifted out of poverty, still building infrastructure, well, don't follow the Western model. Don't follow that bad example. And there's different ways of doing this. Some people talk about leapfrogging. So for example, rather than building a coal power station and then having to take it apart later uh, to put renewable energy in, build renewable energy first time around. Or rather than uh, getting rid of all the bikes and everyone having cars, build really good quality public transport and cycling infrastructure. Um, in the first place, and then you don't have to dismantle the unhealthy car culture later. And in some places, having a car is very aspirational, and people want to stop riding a bike and have a car. But then you look at places like Holland, where people had cars in the 70s, and now they've got rid of cars and everyone's moved back to the bike. <laughs> so we need to tell those sorts of stories so that we say, you know what, this is how, in places like Luton, where I live, very car dependent, that is not what the future looks like. Actually, um, as, as the speakers this morning have talked about, there were ways of doing things in the past that were closer to, uh, to a green lifestyle. And we need to hold on to those things at the same time as improving and adding to those, those things through development. I think, I think that many of the things that are happening already in Africa are, are lessons for us in the West for how to do things better. And um, there doesn't have to be any conflict between development and the green agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm interested. Your book has got a very provocative title. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell us a bit about the book. Why did you choose that title? What was your journey there? Mm. And um, what can we learn if we read that book? Mm. Well, for me, I grew up in Madagascar and then in Kenya. And so I've always understood climate change as being a justice issue and um, completely connected with um, real people's lives. And, mm. and those, the people who are most affected by the high carbon emissions of places like Luton are going to be black and brown people in other parts of the world. Um, and so you know, when you look at who has caused climate change, especially through history, it is gonna be majority white populations in the global north and the people who are suffering most are going to be people of color in the global south so there is a racial divide there saying climate change is racist obviously is provocative climate change can't be racist it's not a person it doesn't have opinions but 
climate change is unfolding within a legacy and within a historical context that means it will have this division along racial lines and therefore to all intents and purposes it becomes a racist phenomenon so what i've done in the book is i've tried to explain that in simple language as i've learned it myself because i didn't realize this when i first became involved in climate change action um i i, I couldn't find any books about specifically about climate change and race there were activists who were talking about it there were academics who were talking about it there wasn't a popular book for people like me to try and understand it and so i ended up writing the book that i wanted to read so it's 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 short you can anyone can read it <laughs> uh it's accessible it explains that historical context that we talked about earlier and it moves a little bit towards what we could do about it particularly around the issues of restorative justice and reparations just one more question before i just move on to brother hannington and it's this um is there a, is there a space for the black voice when it comes to climate change because and climate justice because i read a newspaper article i think it was in the um uh the papers guardian hmm. where they had this um dispute because greta thunberg had been articulating a vision with a number of people from across the world latin american and african and when a newspaper picked it up not the, not the guardian when it was picked up in the news the black girl was cut out yeah same thing happened with a very prominent activist in latin america who called out when the black girl was called was was cut out mm. is 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 the black voice welcome is the brown theology the brown agenda welcome within um the climate justice arena or are we just seeing them as responsible for by contributing to overpopulation and therefore we don't want to hear from them what, what's, what's your view on that yeah it's a tricky one isn't it because it becomes a vicious circle where if if here in luton if someone uh comes and joins the local groups they might find that they're the only person of color in the room and so they think well maybe i'm maybe this the space isn't for me so they don't come back and then it's very difficult to kind of get those contributions and um, there's a lot of soul searching within the environmental movement. You know, why, why are we not connecting up uh, and, and, not, and not seeing more people of color involved in the movement? And then you think, well, at the same time, but yes, but where are you <laughs> on issues of race and issues of justice? And um, so much of the green agenda is about nature and about animals and about plants. And of course, those things matter. But if you're talking about that and you're not talking about people, who are suffering now in the Caribbean and in Africa and in Asia, then you're missing all those human impacts. And it's hardly surprising that that doesn't engage the diaspora mm. and that fragmented African identity that we've talked about. So I think there's a huge contribution that can come from the black church and from the black community more generally to bring those human stories to the front of the story that we're telling about climate change. And the, the woman who was cut out of the picture, Vanessa Nakate, um, is a really good example of that. So she's been, you know, on the front cover of Time magazine, and all of a sudden, because of what happened, she she had the courage to tell her story, to say how she felt about being cut out of the picture, and she demanded to be heard. She's written a book now about it, and through her voice and voices like hers, we're beginning to see more and more recognition that actually Africa, in particular is you know the continent most affected by climate change and and so invisible in this debate that the west has been having <laughs> more and more of those voices are needed and it's going to be a very powerful contribution i think to to this whole conversation yeah thank you very much um and uh I, we're not going to explore it but it just strikes me i i know what how i am in terms of a kind of pan-africanist worldview in a sense and I'd, I'd probably get caught up a bit on the debate about race without getting, and there is some, there is something there that's, that's going to have to be really worked through because it's almost as if um, Africans become victims again. But let me just ask you one more question that comes to mind. Um, Robert, Bre or just the thing, Robert Breckford, Professor Robert Breckford, made a very interesting point. He was doing a, 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 a lecture one day and he said he, he sent his students out to the library to go and find, um, you know, white theologians that are, with Britain that have written a book on race mm. and he said um they they couldn't find any and he asked them to go and find go and find books of 
uh, white theologians about animals and whether they go to heaven. And he said they, they were in the hundreds um, in terms of um, the kind of attention that had been, been paid to that. So the question I would ask is this, what do you think white environmental activists, white climate justice activists can do to facilitate and to amplify the voices of Africans that do turn up in those predominantly white spaces? Yeah, well, I think for, speaking for myself, the most important thing for me has been to go looking for those people who have written books and who have uh, written articles and presentations and really make an effort to look for those voices. So a, a couple of years ago, I wrote a list of uh, the top 50 books on climate change and how many of them were written by women was one thing and also by people of color. And in that top 50, there was one written by uh, an Indian uh, man, Indian mm. writer called Amitav Ghosh. So, you know, in the climate change debate, those voices, certainly in the past, haven't been cutting through. Yeah. And so you have to go looking for um, the activists who can tell you a different story than the yeah. one you're going to hear from all those best known white <laughs> middle class activists. Uh, go looking and educate yourself, as, as Hannington was saying earlier. Thank you very much. Um, we've got Sarah Jane, who's joined us as well. Thank you for your contributions, Jeremy, and we'll try to come back to you a bit later. Sarah Jane, thank you uh, for joining us. And I want to just pose a question to you. Uh, but before, before I do that, just tell us a bit about yourself. I'll give you the opportunity to do that. Tell us a bit about yourself, what you, where, you, where you work and how long you've been um, involved in this area of climate justice. And then I'll just pose a question to you. So welcome. Thank you so much, um, Reverend. Uh, so I'm Sarah Jane J. I'm a Christian Aid uh, Climate Justice Church Program Manager. Um, I've been working um, and supporting marginalised communities for over 14 years, um, I'm mainly within kind of the local communities, working with um, churches as well. Um, and, you know, this is kind of pan London. Um, and now in my role at Christian Aid gives me the opportunity to kind of see how their needs and experiences and lived, particular lived experiences, how does that translate globally? You know, what are, you know, are they experiencing the similar experiences, patterns, and you know, what kind of approaches can we all take to be able to um, affect change? Um, but what's really exciting about my role at Christian Aid is that um, we've been working with a range of black churches, theologians, and um, activists of colour to really um, amplify their voices and perspectives on climate um, justice. How do they connect to this issue and um, creating platforms together to be able to campaign for change? So, so thank, that's exciting and brilliant. And, uh, it, you know, you'd be free to share some of that information in terms of ways people can connect. But let me ask you as well, what have you found to be some of the um, points of perhaps resistance and what have you found to be the points where people find an easy access and are able to feel that they can contribute to this debate within African and Caribbean spaces? I think it's one of the um, areas is around our awareness you know and the visibility of information that tell our own stories and lived experiences you know as, as we've heard from you know our speakers today who've eloquently spoken about our history and connections to this issue and also about church involvement um, as well as also systemically you know how the movement um, indirectly or unknowingly can you know um, be, be a bit racist <laughs> um, in its ways um, means that information is not accessible and also the framing around climate change um, as a result of that doesn't quite often resonate with people of color. Um, and, you know, our frame of reference in terms of how we come into the movement, you know, you know currently at the moment, it is based around um, ecology, you know, the green agenda, as uh, Reverend Israel put it. Um, but that's not necessarily our frame of reference, you know, historically, and as, as a result of, you know, um, you know, slavery and, and, and other things, we have a deep connection to this issue. And so the, the brown agenda centers around our lived experience, which is often not visible. 
um, and so that could create huge barriers towards you know um, you know how we become aware of this issue how we resonate with this issue and also how we get involved and where to get involved because you know it's it can be quite daunting going into white spaces um, where there is lack of representation um, and, and, and trying to be able to gauge, you know, how do you come into that space and build the confidence to be able to speak about this issue from your lived experience, which is not widely shared. Um, and so, you know, these are the kind of challenges um, that our, our um, people face at the moment. Um, yeah. Look, I, I realize the dangers of the next the question I'm about to ask you next. Um, I know in South Africa, apartheid started simply because the Dutch Reformed Church wanted white and black people to worship separately, and it developed into a whole superstructure that excluded people for hundreds of years. But um, when, when I talk about racial justice and other issues, I often say that it's important for African and Caribbean people to find their own space, find their own narrative, and then join the conversation because there's dangers of collusion, marginalization, exploitation, and all those things. Um, in the light of what we've heard, Jeremy's book says that the climate justice movement is, is racist. Reverend Israel's point that the legacy of the transatlantic uh, slave trade and this interconnection with, um, with climate justice. Brother Hannington talks about the need to develop solidarity across borders and movements. Um, do we need to have our own internal conversation before we start to start to try and engage with the broader conversation? So that as Brother Hannington said, we come as a critical mass uh, and therefore our voice is amplified, or do we just continue to chip away and incrementally get visibility and vocality in those spaces that were that already exist? I think it's important for us to look at this and reflect on it as our shared experience. You know, because I think sometimes when we, you know, reflect on our own, which I think is really important to see how we connect to this issue and why we should get involved, sometimes it can become a case of either deterring us from, from, from you know, exploring who else has gone through this, who else is feeling this way, who else feels like, you know, why aren't there representation or why on the framing of this conversation being looked at from, you know, um, a diverse perspective, you know, or um, voice. So, and I think sometimes that can cause us to think, well, actually, perhaps maybe our lived experience reflecting on our own is too unique to be shared with others or to enter into discussions where this, this um, where climate change is actually being explored. So I think it's important for us to come together, you know, um, as Christians, as people who care about, um, you know, our lived experience, telling our own stories, and also care about extending, you know, um, that grace, that love, that justice, and really putting our faith in action to other people who are affected by this. And I think by coming together, um, you know, in our churches, you know, recognizing that churches and including black, black majority churches, we have large diaspora communities who are there as a result of, to some extent, um, climate change, you know, whether that's been displaced, you know, from a range of different countries, including Africa, and seeking refuge or asylum in, in the UK, where the church is the main support system to help them to rebuild their lives. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a great space for us to come together and unite as believers and as people who care about this issue to, to talk about this issue. I also think it's important for us to seek out activist organizations, you know, Christian Aid, Tear Fund, um, Evangelical Alliance, who are looking at this issue. I'm looking at this issue also on the basis that, you know, um, you know, how can how can the church really speak into the lives of its members and people around the world? You know, I'm very mindful, as is you know, Christian Aid, that you know, churches have become global as a result of the pandemic. With a lot more online services, it also means that churches can reach, you know, people and speak into their lives, you know, around love, hope, justice 
and and really helping them to see God in their situation and parts of those people tuning in um, on the online Sunday service are also those in climate vulnerable countries and we can't forget that you know and so how do we kind of join up with organizations um, as much as activists um, to be able to show people um, joining online um, or in, in person um, who are from climate vulnerable countries at their church are aware of this issue, they're seeking to know more, and they want to unite with others to be able to do something about it. You know, and I think that would be a powerful message for the church. And also, more importantly, make the church more relevant, you know, and really show the church faith in action in, you know, kind of speaking truth to power, standing out boldly for justice in a way that shows people how relevant it is. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask you one more question because I know our speakers have had an opportunity to speak. I want to make sure the panelists are heard and that it's not perceived as a bit part in any way. And thank you for your contribution. It's been um, very nuanced and very helpful. And just to say, I was I know you weren't responding to it, but to everyone, I wasn't saying we should be separate. I was asking the question because I know it will be in people's minds as to whether we continue to experience those microaggressions in those spaces or we go into a safe space and start to develop our own narrative before we converge again. But there's a question that came in yesterday, we looked at the whole area of justice and worship. And uh, we had a very powerful time in terms of both the content. And then at the end, we actually had the three worship leaders that came lead us in a time of worship and in a time of prayer. And someone has put a question in there, Marcio Gundia said, yesterday we spoke about moments of worship and having global impact. And our question is, how can a local children's work as an expression of their worship with others build a strong positive response to addressing climate change locally and globally? How can a local children's work as a response to their worship to God, how can it build and how can it address the issue of climate change locally and globally? Yeah, well, that's a really great question. I think, you know, amongst kind of children and young people, you know, climate uh, crisis really resonates with them a lot, you know, and, and I've seen in my line of work, you know, um, particularly in churches where, you know, the, the children and family services, you know, some of the climate campaigns and activism has really come from, you know, the Sunday school services where they are um, writing, um, letters of creation you know so and particularly within the work that we do at christian aid um, around letters of creation we've seen lots of children young people in churches and schools you know get together and you know write about their climate concern you know and and really putting you know their hearts on paper about what kind of changes they think needs to happen and that in itself is their own form of campaign really to share their thoughts and perspectives on the issues, um, you know, why they care about it, why other, um, you know, children, young people and families should do something about it. And we've also seen um, many kind of get involved in petitions and write to their local MPs and, and actually say, you know, this, this is what needs to be done. Um, and I think it's a great way for, for um, it to also start a movement, really hearing the voices of children and young people coming together to be able to share what they're concerned about and also take positive action together, you know, um, whether that's recycling um, in their local communities, um, whether that's also getting involved in um, kind of eco churches, um, as much as also thinking about other children and young people in Africa, in India and other parts of the majority world who don't have the same infrastructure, you know, and who um, are currently struggling. And so what does net zero mean for them? You know, for instance, um, I'm thinking about stewardship, you know, starting from that early age yeah. um, to be able to really make a difference to other ch children, and young people around the world. 
Thank you very much for that. We may come back to you in a, in a bit. We're going to just, uh, I'm going to pose a question that's coming to Brother Hannington. And this question comes from Reverend Paul Akinola. And he says, growing up in, a north, in northeastern Nigeria, uh, Lake Chad was a huge source of water supply, fishing, agriculture, and transportation. It also provided a bridge between the hot air from the desert and the vegetation of the Sahel region. But all that is gone because of climate change. Boko Haram and other terrorist groups move with relative ease and access across the region from Chad, Niger, Cameroon, and Nigeria. Um, and all these have benefited from Lake Chad. Uh, he asked what can be done in supporting these kind of regions where climate change is having not just an ecological impact, but an, an impact on people and an impact on politics and economics. What can be done to support these regions? Wow, what a big question. I think it goes back to, to what we've been discussing. I was actually thinking that um, another title for Jeremy's book, if I may, would be um, <laughs> how to discuss uh, how, how, how people in Africa and Asia or people in the, in, in, in the other world view climate change. I think that's another way to say it or understand it or translate it. Because I think the way we translate climate change in most of our communities is, is in terms of uh, its impact on our day to day. And so if you do not speak about climate change in that language, you can talk about the net zero, the 1.5, you can even talk about polar bears. And those we may understand, but we won't relate to, to the heart. And so if you're calling for action, you want to think about what is it that I can do on the ground that makes a difference? So to answer my friend in Nigeria, I'm just reminded of what missionaries did when they came to some of our countries, how they managed to take the gospel all over the world. They would come into a community and build a hospital, and build a school, and do something that is real to the people. I think what needs to be done in Nigeria, again, I believe it's the church, mobilize resources because we won't fill up the lake again. But what we can do is to find other sources of livelihood. What are the people who used to fish in the lake doing today? Are there some greener sources of livelihood that are large enough? And we're not, we're not talking about piecemeal, small amounts, but we can build factories. We can do things that are renewable energy powered. We, we can think about uh, innovations in business uh, that are climate smart in terms of irrigation. We can think about uh, uh, businesses in the, in, in the food value chain that grow food in sustainable manner. We might not necessarily deal with the lake itself, but the things around the people that depended on the lake so that they can see there is an alternative way to prosperity, an alternative way to living well, an alternative way which which lives well, but also does well to the environment. And I think it is thinking about how, how can we think big things? Because I think we've done small things enough. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Brother Hannington, for that. I'm gonna ask each um, person, I'm gonna start with you, Brother Hannington. I'm gonna ask each person uh, a question uh, um, and just to give a very simple answer. And then I'm gonna close with Rev Israel. And I'm going to I'm going to slightly alter the question for you to include some of your material that you've um, written as well. Um, apart from your book, well, this brother Hannington, what one book would you advise for people to read for a solid introduction to this area of climate justice, and perhaps that may even incorporate incorporate elements of um, Afrocentric perspectives? But if there's a generic book do you say I think I'll recommend this book what book would it be please to be honest Jeremy's book climate change is racist okay Jeremy I think you should collect some you should you should, you should be anyway what book would you apart from your book Jeremy because I think your book sounds brilliant what what book would you suggest um I would recommend a bigger picture by Vanessa Nakati who I was mentioning earlier he's an activist from Uganda brilliant thank you very much uh, Sarah Jane, what book would you um, would you recommend if it was one book? 
You're still on mute, sorry. Oh, wow. Apart from what others have shared, I would also recommend our prophetic journey towards climate justice, um, by, which includes um, Reverend Israel and others from our working group. Okay. Thank you very much. Rev, um, what book would you, um, firstly, what book would you recommend, one of the texts that you've written, to help people understand the dynamics around African and Caribbean Christianity in the UK, because that sets a context. And then what one book would you recommend around specifically around climate justice? Thank you very much, Rev. Um, I think in terms of understanding the Black community, Black Christian community in the UK, I would recommend um, my 2015 book, Partnership in Mission, a Black Majority Church Perspective on Mission and Church Unity. Uh, so I think that will really help people to begin to understand what we even mean by the Black church, because a lot of people talk about that, or Black majority churches, and sort of their history, their mission, and their theology. Um, in, in terms of climate, uh, in terms of the subject we are looking at today, actually, I, I'm going to recommend my, my new book, which is Discipleship, Suffering, and Racial Justice. Uh, because one of the things I was trying to do with this new book is to actually situate climate justice as a discipleship issue. And I think oftentimes, again, that's something we don't do. We dichotomize between our discipleship model. Let's do Bible study. Let's go to prayer meeting. But how does that connect to the climate justice issues? How do we speak on justice issues? Or how does that connect with mental health issues? And in this book, I, I was sort of proposing a bigger narrative for our discipleship model that can help us to begin to engage whether it's climate justice or whether it's mental health issues or whether it's racial justice, uh, whatever it is, or even suffering because of the pandemic. So I recommend that book, Discipleship, Suffering and Racial Justice, Mission in a Pandemic World. Okay, um, people have asked if there's gonna be a book list, we'll see what we can do in terms of putting something online. I wanna say thank you to all our contributors. Uh, thank you to Sarah Jane, thank you to Jeremy, Thank you to um, Hannington and thank you to Rev Israel. I just want to ask one question actually to you, Sarah Jane. Um, often within African and Caribbean communities, there's a, a, a well, within all communities, but there has been a, a kind of gender war, a gender differences in perspective, women having a kind of double jeopardy in terms of race and culture and so on. Is, does that play itself out in terms of the climate justice agenda? Um. I think it does, um, you know, and I, I think it, particularly in the in the area we work in, especially with 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 within the church context, it would be wonderful to also hear more, you know, kind of female voices. You know, I think that you know, um, you know, male pastors have made a tremendous contribution to this issue, and their voices have really blazed the, the trail for for us to you know, try to deconstruct some of um, the issues surrounding climate change. And I also think there's something prophetic about, you know, kind of female pastors, as well as, as others in the activist that could really add value to that discussion. Um, so I think it's good for us to take an intersectional approach. Thank you very much. And we, we, we hear that. So thank you. And uh, we were challenged powerfully as men to learn to listen to women. Um, this week earlier, and I hope that um, part of your contribution has allowed us to do that, not just in terms of the climate justice debate, but a particular perspective that comes from women. So thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. And if, like I said, if you're around at 3 p.m. this afternoon, please join uh, eBay Giant Killer at uh, Premier Radio. If you're around this evening, join us on uh, TBN and then at nine o'clock, eight or nine o'clock on TBN, nine o'clock you can join us at, at We Are Tear Fund on Instagram for the after party and tomorrow morning for prayer. So thank you, all the panelists. It's been brilliant. You've helped us just be able to earth this um, justice issue in a very practical way. Just to say very quickly, tonight on TBN, there is an exclusive interview with uh, Dr. Bernice A. King, um, the granddaughter of, uh, of, of Martin Luther King, and she will be uh, speaking with Seth Pinnock uh, this evening. So please join in and see what she's got to say. 
God bless you. Thank you to the team. And thank you for everyone that's been hosting. Thank you for being here. God bless and have a good afternoon. Much love. Thank you. Put your hands together. Thank you.